Welcome to the Upholstery Show, live from Arlington, Massachusetts. We're going to serve you up a beautiful bowl of coconut fiber. Really? So here we are. I hope you like that introduction that Patrick um, devised. Um, he's good at these things, and if you saw my last video where he, he likes to fool around a little bit, he's talking about my retirement. That, that's not going to happen for a while, folks, believe me. Um, at 62, though, I'm going strong, I can tell you that. I delivered a sofa the other day. Um, I think you might have seen it. Where's that poster, the world's biggest sofa, Patrick? That, we did a video about it. We did a video about it? Yep. World's biggest sofa is 114 inches long. <laughs> and I delivered it the other day The a customer who's a big burly guy himself uh, helped me up with it. Let me tell you, that was a 400 pound sofa too. I never talked about the weight of that thing. But now I could talk about it. Um, the customer, the customer's looking, don't worry, it got, it got to you in one piece, didn't it, right? But I have a transit and uh, I delivered, I, I, I put the, the sofa in and about 40 inches were hanging out the back. Even though I had it tied in, the, the sofa was going up. Uh, you know, it was, every bump that it hit, the sofa would go up. So I had to have my I'm holding the sofa down. Uh, it, it was unbelievable. I've never had a sofa that big. Uh, what a what a project! But I'm glad it's out of the shop because it took up the whole shop. I wouldn't be sitting here right now from where I'm sitting to where Michaela is behind the camera. That's how long the sofa was. So it had to come in here and get out fast. Um, so anyhow, we have a lot of business, and I had my triple shot of cappuccino, so I should I should be on uh, on the mark. You guys have any questions, please feel free at any time. That gets priority as I'm reading through here. And I hope that I have time to show you this, this project here that I have. It's a small project. But it's tied into, um, you know, how to make extra money in the upholstery business. It's, it's a repair job, which can be quite lucrative. And there's a lot of repair work out there, you guys. So you guys should look into that if, you're, if you want. Uh, but this is an example. Right here, I'll show it to you. We just did a, a YouTube video on this, but hopefully I'll get to that. But anyhow, let's let's get to the business at hand. And Tony, Tony, who's one of our founding members on the Facebook, uh, and we're really thrilled that she communicated again with us. I don't think we've heard from her in a while, have we, Patrick? I think we have, usually every week. Oh, do we? She says, and this is going to be up right now, right, Pat? Yeah, I'm just going to adjust it. Patrick's on the ball, isn't he, you guys? This looks easy, doesn't it, the way he does it? But it it's isn't. I mean, that, getting them all to fit in the screen. It's the <laughs> editing that goes be on behind the scenes here, even on the YouTube channel, you know, we, 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 we do edit. And, and that takes time. And um, But the online classes, they were just finishing up, what, two or three of them, Patrick? Right. We're going to have a lot of content. By the way, I'm just going to say, say it before I say anything else. Now would be a good time to join to subscribe for yearly subscription, right, Patrick, to the online classes? Yes, we have like five classes. We, we've there. got the content that's up there now is amazing content, I think. A um, lot of work behind it. Like I said, a lot of editing. We try not to waste too much film, but you guys get the most out of your, out of your money. But I think it's the best uh, bargain in the whole website, really. So check it out. Um, I don't know if Patrick's got coming attractions on that or... But I'll tell you that there's at least three classes that are about ten, ten classes long each, Patrick. I mean, Jimmy's is, you know, that's about the longest one I've ever done. So it's like 30, 30 segments, you know, all together. So, and plus the ones we already have up there. So yeah. it, that is growing. I think that's going to become a better value as the more, obviously, the more that we post. Right, Patrick? Yeah. So, and, uh, so yeah, Michelle's class, I did post about it. It's going to be called the, what was it again? It's an it's antique tufted. tufted uh, some it's a diamond tufted uh, diamond tufted chair. Yeah. How was it? And somebody was asking last week about that, and and that's a perfect uh, show for them. They want to. That's an online class for them. Anyhow, right, let's Tony's get Tony's project is up. Tony has an interesting project that she she's got up there. She says while tearing down this very old chair, it does look old. Um, I discovered that the bottom was only supported by jute slats and some broken pieces of wood. So I've got it all to the bare wood. I'm wondering if I should put springs in while I've got it torn down and just put jute slats back in the proper way. What do you guys think? I don't want to change the look of the chair. I assume you have all the, the padding that was in there, including the horse hair. So I'm looking at this. Uh, my, my feeling is that it, if this is really old, it probably didn't have springs, number one. If it had springs at some point, somebody decided, and maybe rightfully so, 
that it wouldn't support springs because of the age of the piece. So you kind of, you guys have to use your discretion here when you when you're doing pieces. And really, if this is for a customer, communicate this with the customer. But it might have been a good decision the last time when the upholsterer took the springs out. I don't often say that because I'm a big believer in the coil springs, right? You guys have seen the videos. But this could be an example of um, maybe um, if the chair's that old, it wouldn't support it. I mean, if you want to put a lot of woodwork into it and then put the springs in, that's what I would advise you. And if you're going to be springing this, you'd use number one springs, Tony. You do uh, the jute webbing on the bottom, not at the top like I see it here. And then uh, follow the instructions on the YouTube. Right? We've got a great tutorial on there on how to tie eight-way tie springs that's been up. I think, Patrick, how many views do we have on that? That, that's what was that? that was our first video. One of the first videos, but one of the most popular ones. Yeah. yeah. Over 100,000. We did that. Think, yeah. We, we did? Yeah, we made a better quality. Oh, okay. Um, and if Tony's going to keep it the way it is, then I don't have a problem with just replacing the webbing. But I would say add, add burlap to that. It doesn't look like it. I don't know if you took the burlap off on the seat, but take, put burlap on to fill in the rest of the holes there. And then try to use as much, if you want to keep the integrity of the look of the chair, try to keep as much of the original padding as possible. Good question, though. So the next one is another. Oh, this is from Erica. Yes, oh, I Erica love this. Says hello. She's here. Hi, Erica. Um, she says, I just bought this small sofa for my tweener daughter's room makeover. I seem to have a yen for mid-century modern pieces that I have no idea how to upholster. This one won't be, uh, by the way, um, don't be in, don't feel bad. Mid-century furniture in its simplicity is not easy to do. Um, you have to remember when they design mid-century furniture, they actually have engineers engineering it and they actually prototype many, many before they get to the, the manufactured, desired manufactured piece. So what that means for an upholsterer is that you're not you don't, oftentimes, sometimes it comes to me with no fabric at all. You are the person designing it and making those templates and, and engineering a mid-century furniture. And they're all different, too. All different. So it really does test your skills in upholsterer. So, um, you know, I hear this a lot. Some upholsters don't even do mid-century furniture for this reason. Um, she goes on, this one won't be my usual velvet since it's going to be in the kids' room. So master upholsterers. How do I approach this one? I hope to be on next week's live. Let me answer that before, and, and she's here now. I hope to be on next week's live, so hello, Erica. Um, she says, I keep, I'll, I'll just finish. I keep missing them because the kids are back on online school and it's a six hour commitment for me just to keep everyone on task, wow. Um, well, keep it up, Erica, you're doing a great job there. I hope everyone is doing great, we are, and I hope that, uh, good luck with the online classes. And hope Thanks, to, Erica. Yeah. So the, the, what I'm looking at is a piece of furniture that has, if it's been reupholstered, which I have no idea if it has, or if that's the original upholstery, I, I, I would say that they have kept the, the integrity or the lines of this piece very well. And I wouldn't be too intimidated by this particular mid-century because it does remind me a little bit of traditional upholstery. I think you've got a lot of straight lines there that you can work with easily. Just what I would do is recommend when you're cutting this out, try to keep as much. It looks like it's in really good shape, Erica. I don't think you have to do a lot of internal work. So follow, you know, some of the reupholstery uh, jobs that I do. Like the one that we do on YouTube um, is really good because it's the it's the tufted the diamond tufted sofa that we show. That's a reupholstery job, meaning we didn't take it down to the frame. Um, this doesn't require that, I don't think. So, so what it means is you take it apart very carefully. You take the outside arms out, the outside backs off, the outside back off, and you loosen everything else. And then, and then you cut your fabric to you know rectangulars, a little bit bigger than what you have. You've seen those videos too. I think I, I think I'm going over old ground for Erica too, but it's worth it for other people out there. And then you you um, cut your patterns from the oversized cuts that you have and so I'll do all your sewing make your buttons even if you want and then upholster one thing at a time take off the fabric for the seat upholster it take off the fabric for an inside arm upholster it and so on let me tell you how much easier that is than tearing the whole thing apart it just adds to your time not only that 
it, it it's going to affect the way it ultimately looks because I like these lines so I'll keep them as much as possible. Is Eric, Eric, if you want to ask a question now, um, you can if, if a follow up. Yeah, she said, does it look like it has a lot of sewing? It has um, sewing, I think, I don't know if those are, those are paneled arms. So the only thing that looks like it's sewn is the top of the seat and the inside back has a box in it. Not much sewing, Erica. No, I think you're going to find this pleasantly, you're going to be pleasantly surprised by this piece. Um, you'll be able to do this. This isn't a typical mid-century. Um, so you should be fine on this one. You should be good. Um, so now we have some comments on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Uh, Caroline, uh, she says, on the stuffing a cushion cheaply and effectively. Uh, does anyone? Effectively. Yeah. Does anyone know what material is used to keep polyester filling together in the back cushion? What material? The one I have is falling apart and I want to sew a new one, but can't figure out what material is used. It almost looks like it's interface. So so she's definitely talking about Dacron when she says polyester, and there are at least two variations of Dacron. One is bonded Dacron, which I wouldn't use in a back cushion because it's not soft. Sometimes I use it on a seat cushion, certainly. Um, and not too thick, maybe a, a half inch on a seat cushion. But on a back cushion, I would use a sewn. I think she's talking about it's it's loose Dacron, and then on both sides it's a cheesecloth, or you can get it as a cheesecloth, and they do sell it with a synthetic liner too. That you might be mistaken for interface, or it is interface, and then they stitch it. It's like stitching for that for everything is kept together, loose Dacron pretty much is kept together by that. What that is, that's a softer uh, Dacron that's used on the back to go over like a soft foam or something like that. So that's probably what she's looking at there. But you know, my opinion on a back cushion, you guys, I think um, unfortunately a lot of times money is, money is, a, a, is a problem or an obstacle for some people and uh, the best back cushion available anywhere is a channeled down feather cushion and it's 50-50, 50 down, 50 feather, and that's it. That is the best cushion you can get anywhere for your back. Because remember, we've talked a little bit about how much weight or how much support is needed for back cushions, loose back cushions, and you know, it's not as much obviously as sitting on something. So you're going to get about, you know, I'm, I'm pushing myself back to figure out how many pounds per square inch I am here. So. I don't know, maybe 30 to 40 pounds, whereas I'm over 200 on the seat. So therefore, it's a, it's a totally different uh, cushioning for seats and backs. Does that make sense? I wouldn't use springs, I wouldn't use a spring down cushion in the back either. I would use, I would use a spring down cushion on a seat, because that's, that's the ultimate, ultimate seating, you guys. Spring down cushion, spring with the wrap it down and feather on the seat 50-50, and on the back, all feather and down cushion. That's, the, that's premium. So then she says, um, uh, the one I have is falling. Okay, I already read that. Okay. Any live questions, Michaela? Not yet? Um, no comments? Erica yeah. says thank you. Oh, you're welcome, yeah, Erica. Thank you. I mean, we're thinking about those Zoom classes, aren't we, Patrick? Yes, and Erica's interested, so if we do that, <laughs> she'll... Be one of the first. <laughs> yeah, she. Sorry, she, I lost my train of thought. I that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is one yeah, of my. Yeah, she was interested. I didn't talk about that right now. I, mean, I put a poll out, okay. and we got a few people that are interested. So maybe we really have to consider that. So I was a little hesitant on this. I, Patrick will tell you that um, the way I had it envisioned, you guys, and I know that this sounds stupid, right, Patrick? He's gonna, he's gonna kill me for mentioning this. The way I had it, you know, when you go into Best Buy and they got all the flat screens set up. You walk down the aisle and you can see all the flat screen TVs. Well, that's how I would like eight person to be on a flat screen TV. So it would be like a regular, a regular classroom instead of just being in front of the camp, in front of the screen, and and talking to you know what is it four or five people at a time, Patrick, in a split screen? Is that right? right? In a split screen, <laughs> and and each one of you guys is about what four inches tall. How am I going to do that, Patrick? With the ah, uh, you can do it. I know I can do it, but it would be easier. My idea, 
I mean, you'd have to have a lot of dough right me, which I don't know, but wouldn't that be cool? Like, walking down, I could walk down, just like a regular classroom, like the center aisle, and see everybody in, kind of like, in their full figure, you know? That's how I think, I envision it. He thinks, he's laughing in the back, he knows, I know, I know, I know it's stupid, right, right, Michaela? <laughs> Right, Patrick? I just think it would be cool. That, that was our original vision for the classes yeah. back when we first started. Was that what we were talking originally, really? Yeah, they're supposed to be live. So now it would be cool to go back to that and make it happen. You know? Yeah. Um, so this is one of my favorite videos that I'm about to read a comment on. I, I like this video because it's fixing a pop button for free. And um, I love those, you know, I, I guess they're called public service uh, ones that we do. Right, Patrick? Right. Um, they get a lot of interest, and we save people a lot of money. I mean, one pop button, this one doesn't have buttons, one pop button on a sofa to get it fixed, you'd be surprised. Some, some opposers say, I can't fix it, you got to bring it in, or I'll pick it up, but it's going to cost you this much to pick it up. And then they charge you a flat rate. You know, something like that, like in a metropolitan area, could be a $300 fix on a button, really. But people, uh, we devised, or I devised this way of doing it without specialized tools too, which I know admittedly it's not as effective as buying the real tools like we have available at Broadway Upholstery School, put a little plug in there, and we have kits that we've devised just for fixing buttons, so make it a lot easier, and by the way, the video I show, we show two ways of doing it, one with the professional tools and then one, with, I mean that's with the German needle and clasps and all that. Um, the other one is with home tools, with uh, anybody has a washer and a, and a twine and a pair of needle nose pliers, I, I show you how to do it. It only works on heavier fabric, it's not going to work on heavy fabric. But I love the fact that we get, we haven't gotten one person's call and say, thanks a lot, I ripped my sofa. <laughs> not one time. So we're doing something right, right Patrick? Yeah. So they say, thank you so much, I'm looking forward to fixing my pop buttons. That's from Sandy. That was three days ago. I wonder what happened. She hasn't contacted us. Hopefully she was successful. I mean, it's, it's not like life-threatening. Anyhow, anyhow, right? <laughs> anyhow, uh, Sylvia, an old friend. Was Sylvia one of the founding members of the Facebook too, Patrick? Yeah, she was there right from the beginning. I'm not um, sure about the Facebook. I think I've seen it. Actually, I'm not sure if this is the YouTube. same. This isn't the same Sylvia commenting on this one, Patrick. Yes, it is. Is it? Yes. Well, this is how to upholster the 1860s uh, chair part five, measuring and applying fabric. I like the icons that Patrick used. You always say that. I know I do. To come up every week. But so everybody <laughs> loves cowboys, right? I've never met anybody. It's a cowboy theme that he's got here. I never met anybody that didn't like a cowboy. What's not to like? Oh, a cowgirl. What's not to like, right? They're out there in the free range, and they're out there on the horse, Patrick, with the, right? Yeah, and they'll laugh. with their scissors and their staple and this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I will tell you a funny story, though. It reminds me, I, I show you my tool. So you guys, speaking of cowboy thing, this is a regulator. And in the old days, they used to call... A six-shooter, yeah. No, they used to call the these right cowboys that were hired hands. You know, if a sheriff was having a hard time with some rowdy uh, people or a gang in a, in a western town, they would call in the regulators. Not that. I thought that's what they called the actual gun. No, that was a regulator was a person that came in. He was kind of like not a, not a sheriff, and he was in between being a bad guy <laughs> and a sheriff. That was a regulator, right? <laughs> and it did come in and clean up the town along with the show. You know, you wonder who. Sometimes they wear white hats and black hats, but you don't know who's wearing. Sometimes you don't know. I guess there's a lot of gray hats out there, right? Anyhow, that would be my last time I go off subject, I, I hope. Right, Patrick? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Patrick doesn't think so. So she says, do you use a different size staple for the webbing versus the cambric? Yeah, sometimes on older pieces like we just saw on, on the first um, that we, we were looking at, that old chair from uh, Tony, sometimes on a chair like that you have to use half inch staples, the, the biggest staples that we get. Um, most of the time I'm using 3 8 inch staples and on cambric if the wood um, is good, um, I would use a quarter, I'd go to a quarter inch. Most of the time the quarter inch staples though are being used 
in panels, you know, front panels that, that come off like it looks like this one, this mid-century furniture that Erica has, has panels on it that you might have to upholster with that quarter inch staples, otherwise they come, the 3 8 might come right through that panel. So you have three distinct sizes and you we do switch out, you know, so that's a good question. And that's also from the 1860s chair, Patrick. And then we have another one I um, from, this is from Violet, and this is an easy paneled arm application. I'm not sure, I can't see this, I'm not sure what's so easy about it. <laughs> it's easy for me maybe, right you guys? Um, she says, I love your tutorials, I'm redoing some parlor chairs, I hope they turn out and then okay. Yeah, I'm sure they will. See, there's so much, you know, when I was, when I was learning, I didn't have the benefit of YouTube. Uh, everything that I learned had to be learned on the job. I have to be honest with you, sometimes it was painful because you'd be asking the same question. People don't like being asked the same question, especially when they, when they you know, you know how it is. But um, I would have loved to have a go-to at nighttime to go to a YouTube station like, like Broadway Upholstery School and learn even more and then come, come the next day and impress my, my co-workers. But the best that we had back then, way back then, might have been 8-track tapes. And I'm not so sure even if upholstery tapes were available back 40 years ago when I was learning. So all of it was contained within the cranium of the person that you were learning from. Um, so that's the whole, another reason why we do the channel, the YouTube channel, um, is that because there's been huge gaps in the learning in, in the knowledge and upholstery, I'm sure some other trades would be would fall into this category. And so a lot of times what we're doing is we're trying to keep an old skill alive by doing these videos. And I think, so far, I think we're successful. I mean, I'm not perfect, and I would advise anybody to, you know, get a diversity in the learning to see. Um, in my experience, there weren't two upholsters that upholstered the same way. But if the ultimately, uh, if the if the project comes out looking good and functional and, and doing what you're supposed to do, like with the Coral Springs, what difference does it make if one guy ties a, a knot over and the other guy ties it under? What difference does that make? So um, that's also why I like upholstery because it it does vary like that. You know, I um, I actually I, I'll tell you a story. I think I told it once, but a long time ago, so I won't bore you guys. I went into a, a, a house locally and I looked at a piece of furniture, it was an old piece, I think it was a Victorian, and I said, I think I know who did this. I, can actually t I could actually tell from the signature of the upholstery, from the style of the upholstery, that that was my mentor. So I, I said to her, I said, I, I, I'm just looking at it. I said, where did you get this done? She said in Newton, but she couldn't tell me which shop it was, which is another town over, which happens to be the shop that I learned a lot of my trade. So when I was taking it apart, sure enough, I took the outsides off and I saw the handwriting of my mentor on the inside of the sofa. I thought that was the greatest thing. It was, it was so fun to, to be able to do his work again, to keep things going. See, we keep things alive, right? So we have uh, Caitlin, and she's, she's commenting on the do-it-yourself upholstery. By the way, do we have any questions or comments, Patrick? Live? Okay. D, uh, do-it-yourself upholstery and sew for part one, stripping fabric. That was the one I was talking about earlier to Erica that she might want to look at, I mean, to see the layers and how we, we take things apart and prep each piece of front of each piece as we upholster. Um, so Caitlin says, so I'm trying to redo my leather couch, but I can't remove the cushions. So how would I remove that? So she doesn't say if there were seat cushions or back cushions. So, and she's trying to reupholster it. Wow, she's, she's brave. I'm not sure if she's going to reupholster it in leather or not, but I can tell you that a typical leather sofa takes, um, if I had to guess, let's see, 15 times uh, 150, 250, 300. You're talking maybe six hides of leather, six cows, six cows to do one sofa. That's, that's, that's a lot of leather. I have not done a leather sofa in 40 years or so. I remember way back we did it. Um, 
but leather is so costly. The reason is it's so costly. So today, that sofa that I did, uh, that big sofa, the world's biggest sofa, was a faux leather. could hardly tell the difference. And the thing about faux leather is it's easier to work than leather, too. Um, but you have to make sure you get a good faux leather, though. There's some faux leather knockoffs out there that are just not worth the time. So be careful of that. And the same goes with leather. You know, I had somebody call me say they want to get their own leather. And I know they're going to go online and search out leather, and it looked great online. And most people don't know how many different leathers that are out there, the different qualities of leather. You know, the best leather in the world is a leather that, it's Italian leather. And it's the leather that they, leather's usually four millimeters thick. Okay, that's how thick it is. Um, it's the bottom two millimeters that's the best leather. That's the unblemished leather. Um, you get a good platform to work your dyes in. And that's another thing, dyes. Uh, so that's a good leather that's dyed many times and, and hand dyed and really done nicely. That's the Italian leather that comes out really soft. It almost comes out a really good Italian leather. Comes out feeling like the faux leather is the good faux leather is today. It's thin and it's really, it's really beautiful, it's polished. The other way, the top two millimeters, the, the bad guys get it, right? The, the, the bad manufacturers. So, and a lot of times those cows are grazing um, with, with barbed wire or razor wire. So when you get in the top two, two, two uh, millimeters, which are really cheap, and you go online and say, oh, the leather's cheap, I'm going to get it. They'll have cuts and bruises all over that hide because of that. <clears throat> and it's not great and holes in the hide and everything else in the middle of the hide and you have to cut around it it's thinned out in places where it shouldn't be so really be careful with leather I hope that you learned something new there um, so we have uh, stuffing a, another comment on stuffing a cushion cheaply uh, many thanks from Egypt well from Egypt Patrick I don't think we had anybody from Egypt before it's funny you're mentioning that last time did I? <laughs> that we might have had somebody from Egypt, but now we actually do. We have <laughs> Maha from Egypt. So that's the only thing I think about is Egypt is the pyramids. That's, I, can't, I can't get my I mind off the pyramids. I do want to say something about pyramids, Patrick, and about what they find inside pyramids, and about how you would be astonished. Coconut fiber? Close. <laughs> Close. So, um... What they find when they when they went into it, I'm, I'm not sure if it was King Tut's tomb or whatever it was, but they'd go in and, and they, they would find on the floor just like du dust or remnants of what a piece of furniture was. And, and you know, there'd be gold leafing in there, there'd be wood, they could tell there was, there was wood at the one time or metal pieces and everything. And, and of course it was not disturbed at all. So on the, it would look like, you know, one of those outlines of a CSI, you know, a body. It, there'd be outline of a piece of furniture that was there, and they were able to actually reconstruct that and make, the, and you know, reconstruct, you know, a reproduction of what was there. You know, can you believe that? And the other thing I want to mention about that is that, you know, about ba about horse hair. I know this is a little girl, it's not horse hair, but you know, mummified bodies, mum, you know, bodies. They, they, you know, they dig the bodies up, and the hair's left. You know, and and you know, horse hair's like that. Horse hair's so resilient. Um, and that's why we like using it. And it, it and it's body horse hair and it comes in these little, you know, maybe two or three inches long and they're really, you know, I get excited when I talk about horse hair. I'll tell you why. Because each hair is like a little mini spring. So that makes me smile as an upholsterer. What that means is that those little mini springs are working on upholstered seats like this. They're, they're constantly, and it takes a long time for them to go back down. So they're constantly these little mini springs, and there are millions of them, right? And uh, millions, maybe ten thousand in a seat like this. But they're all working like that, as well as the springs that are in this. So you can imagine that's the ultimate seating. It's it's the ultimate seating. It's going to last a long time, many years. Anyhow, do we have any other comments? No. Many thanks from Egypt. You're welcome. Someday I'd like to visit the pyramids, and if I do, I want to tour King Tut's tomb, if you don't mind. All right, Patrick? That's Maybe that'll be our first seminar. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Wouldn't that be cool, doing a seminar in front of the, in front of the uh, pyramids? Yeah, though I heard that area is very uh, 
dangerous for Taurus. Ah, I'm not worried yeah. about it. I have my stable gun. <laughs> Uh, but people get they get like swindled and stuff like that. They have these carts going around. I heard, and they I yeah, know, and they I got that big steal information. Patrick no, says I, I got that big thing on my forehead, right, Patrick? Well, a big owl for losing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I know you are. So we got Daniel. He's commenting on the biggest sofa ever seen, and Patrick's got the sofa in outer space because I said to Patrick um, there was. Every once in a while, NASA says, and there's an asteroid approaching Earth, and it's the size of a bus, or it's the size of a mountain. Recently, they said, this is funny, you guys. NASA said there was an asteroid coming that was the size of the needle in London, right? And needle? Isn't that Seattle? No, London. The London Space needle. Needles. But maybe Seattle has one too, Patrick. Yeah, they both do. They oh, both really? do. Well, the one in the one in London is a Ferris wheel, right? A big Ferris wheel. We call it a Ferris wheel, right? So when they said that, NASA said, "There's an asteroid heading to Earth, and it's as big as the London needle." People weren't taking it seriously because they thought they meant like sewing needles. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I wouldn't be afraid of a sewing needle being hurtled at, at Earth. I don't think we'd worry about that. But I do worry about something the size of that. That's a big Ferris wheel. I think it's the biggest Ferris wheel in the world. In the world. But anyhow, so Patrick put our sofa in. The London Eye. The London Eye. That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. See, I was thinking Eye of the Needle. But the, the London eye, that was even worse, right? So they, they associated the eye with the needle and, you know, and all that. How harmful could it be? Anyhow, so we got the next one, Janine. Hi, Janine. Is she on, Patrick, listening? I don't think so. I think maybe the time. Though. Oh, she's also commented on the biggest sofa ever seen. Uh, or at least we have a sofa. I'm sure there are bigger sofas out there. I bet we're going to get calls from people saying, I know where there's a bigger sofa. Uh, that's fine. Maybe we should ask people what's the biggest sofa. Yeah, if, you got the, if you think you have a sofa that tops that one, please send it in. Please, I want to see it. Every once in a while I see some some guy with a limousine service who decides he wants the biggest, longest stretch limousine. And sometimes they can get pretty big, huh, Pat? Right. But uh, I've never seen a contest for biggest sofa in the world. Um, Daniel says, nice. Janine, no, Daniel said nice, right, yeah, and Janine yourself. says, yeah, is that front rail boards, okay, because she's asking about something here. We actually showed this on the front part of it about why there was a problem with that, right, Patrick? And yeah. we fixed it. She says, is that is that front rail board solid timber or M MDF across the front? Excuse me. Is the frame good quality? Will last for many years or not? Looking forward to seeing this. Unfortunately, I could I didn't have the time to do a, a video on that, right, Patrick? Yeah. But it had plywood. It wasn't solid timber. No. Uh, MDF would be what I would call it. Sure. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't last. I mean, it was constructed well. I can tell you that it was constructed very well. So. Uh, that, I would say, is a generational piece of furniture, um, certainly. I don't think they could ever construct that with regular construction, too. I think the weight would have been prohibitive. I mean, it was heavy enough the way it was. I had a sofa in here. Actually, it's still here. It's, it's a, it was a sofa from the 50s. It's not mid-century. This, this sofa is much smaller than, the one, than that big one, and it's heavier believe it or not, than that one. So the stock that they would use on a sofa like that would have to be this thick. And I would say that the, the weight on that would be extreme. And that's one, and also the cost. Cost would be uh, extreme too. So that's why you wouldn't see a newer furniture made with, with regular hard wood. I mean, the smaller pieces are. We have featured on the Broadway Upholstery School dot com, we have featured a hardwood frame that comes with a kit. That's solid ash, and that piece, of, that, that, that's really a, a good wood. I mean, it's a hard wood, um, but I, I, I tend to see the hard woods more on smaller pieces, not sofas. So uh, the next one is uh, from India, I think. Anil? Yeah. 
Um, he's also commenting on the biggest sofa. He says he's looking for what seems interesting series. Series it would be waiting. Oh boy. So he also thought that we were going to make a, a big, uh, you know, YouTube. I think a YouTube video on this stuff. Yeah, I thought, I thought we should have done too. I know, but part of the problem, you guys, is that I am a I am a shopper. I have customers that want their furniture, and in this case, that piece of furniture was a family. That's where the whole family. I think there was like a husband and wife, and three or four kids, and that's where they live on it. So I had to get that back fast. This, these things take long. They look, you know, when we present them on film, they they might look easy, but they they're not done you know, all in one you know go too. I mean we have sometimes we go week to week with those with those videos that's why when you go on YouTube you don't see many of those right Patrick we have the sofa no. that that sofa one that was a lot of work so you're not gonna see a lot of A to Z on the YouTube admittedly um, at least the way I would like to present it I know that there are other upholsters out there doing more and I know this is directed to you probably more they're doing more manufactured style and I have to tell you something you don't learn to me you don't learn a lot of, uh, doing that you might learn some manufacturing techniques but there's a lot that's missing out of the actual technique of upholstering you know that's why the online classes that we have are more suited if you really want that deep learning that deep you know apprenticeship style learning that I was lucky enough to have that's what you get on the online classes I know that we have to pay for, you have to pay for them because it's just so much time that invested. I still think they're a good deal. You should check it out if you haven't already. Sign up for one to see what you think. And then, like I said earlier, the, the year-long subscriptions. And thank you for everybody, too, who I think two of our year-long subscribers are watching right now. Right, Patrick? Yep. And we want to thank them for that. Um, so we'll go to the next one. This is the... Oh, we got a lot of... Um, comments on the biggest so forever, huh Patrick? Yeah, I knew he was. <laughs> oh, and this is a long one. I like I like these long comments, you guys, so I can read them. I, I like I like reading the long ones. So this is from um, AIM A-I-M That is a big couch! Exclamation point. But a nice piece! Exclamation point. Yes. I don't think manufacturers really want to create pieces that last a long time, because I think I was talking about that, because they want people to need to replace them. Absolutely, I agree with that. That really old stuff seems to get reupholstered more. Yes. By the way, thanks for your 1860s upholstery video. I learned a lot! Exclamation point. There's a lot of exclamation points in this one, Patrick. Didn't Seinfeld do something about that? With Enough the with the exclamation points. No more exclamation <laughs> I like it though. I like. I like. It. It's funny. I'm reading this, but I'm not. I'm not uh, reading it like there's an exclamation point. I'm saying there's one. So if I were reading it again, sorry, just indulge me a little bit here, you guys. It would be more like this. That is a big couch, but a nice piece. Good yes. My headphones aren't in. <laughs> I can't do. I can't speak an exclamation. Isn't that funny? Um. Then we go on. By the way, thanks for your 1860s upholstery video. I learned a lot. Another one, 1860s. So that was a good one. I redid. I redid what I think is the Louis the, the 14th chair I found. Or 16, sorry. I found on the curbside for my daughter's room. See, it's reinvention video on my channel. Okay, they have a channel, Patrick. Cool. I didn't do it according to convention. Don't chew me out. Oh wait a minute, I got it right. I didn't do it according to convention. Don't chew me out. He's got that in parentheses. Although I hope to in the future. But I enjoyed the history lesson of your series and filed away the info for when I do it justice to its historical period. You know, I don't have a problem with, um, if it's your own, you can do anything you want with it. Um, and if you're dealing with a customer, like I said, we all already talked about that old chair uh, before that um, sometimes you have to eliminate the traditional and go with the more modern. Uh, I'll tell you what the temptation though is. You always need to tell your client that though. If you have a client you're working with them and could say you know I, I hand tie a springs and I'd be happy to do it for this piece uh, but it's going to cost X. However I can do foam seat 
and um, it will cost much less because it's about one tenth the time. And what's interesting about this, you guys, is that foam is a, an interesting and wonderful material uh, because it can actually duplicate at least the look and some comfort of a crown seat if you do it right. And it does take about tenth the time. But be honest with your customers. Tell them that. If they, if they choose those shoes. A lot of people though from my experience will choose the coil springs. That's my experience. <clears throat> but anyway. Stuffing a cushion cheaply. This is the last uh, comment uh, on YouTube. Uh, how about for those cushions without a back? How about those cushions without a back? I guess I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. Let's look at this again. How about for those cushions without a back? Hmm. Well, this is from TV. TV, if you want to be a little bit more uh, clear on that, I don't know what you mean by that. Send us a follow-up. Huh? Send us a follow-up. Send us a follow-up, and I'll be happy to answer that. So, Patrick... How much time do we have left for an hour? Uh, 20 minutes. Left, 20 minutes. So. so you know what? It gives me time to do this chair. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free. Patrick's about to post a video that we did on this. Um, and if the video is about how to take something apart carefully, that's only going to be repaired. So you guys might be able to piece together um, the whole process. We didn't have, I didn't really want on that YouTube video show the whole process. I wanted to actually show you how to carefully take fabric apart. That, that's the whole idea of that one. And that's going to be coming out Monday, and that's called... So Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. That, what's that called, Patrick? Uh, fixing the coil springs from above, or from the top. Fixing the springs I from thought the it was above, but you said top. From the top, yeah. right, which is a little different. I, was, You've I, was, seen, I wasn't sure of the difference. Well, it is different because the, we've shown how to repair from the bottom. This right. is a little different that the top needed, which is a little bit harder to do. So, so like Daniel says, nope, you can't think of any of the, any bigger sofas. <laughs> Daniel is an upholsterer too, isn't he, Patrick? I'm not sure, but he said, I saw a, a fake big sofa in a theater once. <laughs> Maybe in a movie he's talking about or something. I think we could have put tires on this and an engine and drove it down the well, street. Well, someone did that with us. I saw something like that. Somebody did that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People think of the craziest things, don't they? Oh, yeah, sorry, go back to... Uh, about the chair. So the chair, so on the YouTube video, I bring it up, I, I, all this is a pot, this is flapped forward, and then I show, I, I bring it to the springs, and then I refer people to our eight-way tie spring seat if they were following along. So you're caught up. If you see the video, and then you go to our eight-way tie, you're caught up if you have a piece like this and you want to do it at home. So we have a, a live question. Uh, this is from LV. What are some jobs that you feared on taking on? Oh, I'll tell you, I, one of my most fearful jobs and um, was... I the, think I know this. You tell me what I'm going to say. The Napoleon chair? Yeah, but <laughs> you know why? Because yeah, he messed it up. I mean, that's a... Well... no going back. I had to take out a $2 million insurance policy on that chair. That's why. That was that was crazy. The customer wanted to bring it in themselves. They said, "No, no, I need to pick it up. I don't want you to, to ruin it. I had to go pick it up and take out." You could get insurance policies for a brief amount of time, otherwise it would have. Come. But if something had ever happened to that chair in transit or at the shop, uh, boy, you can imagine that would have, that would have been costly. So that I think that was my most nerve wracking. The other one uh, was I upholstered a sofa on a. Um, well, when I first estimated the sofa, it was on a, a yacht in Boston Harbor. It was a wicked good job in Boston Harbor, right, Patrick? <laughs> you don't even have to fake it, though. I don't have to fake my accent because it's already there. <laughs> Anyhow, so I went on and estimated a sofa. It was a sofa, a regular sofa. It was a little scaled down, you know, not as big as that other one. And I gave an estimate, and uh, they said, great. And I, I went to pick the sofa up a couple of weeks later, and I couldn't get it out of the, out of the yard. And so I'm, I'm saying, I don't, what, how did you get it on here? And the customer said, we didn't get it on here. Don't you know that when they build, when they build um, boats, that they, they build the deck of the boat, they have the hull of the boat done, 
and they fill it up with everything, like the sulfur and everything else, and the, and the bathroom stuff and everything else, and then they build around it. And it's not intentional. <laughs> Are you listening to this, Patrick? Yeah, I just can't believe that. And it's not intended for, to go through the little doorway. I mean, I should have well, known the doorway was like... So it breaks, you know? The doorway was like this narrow, you know? And I'm saying, oh, well, they don't call it a doorway, though, on a boat. You have to be careful. What do they call that, Patrick? Uh, no idea. Uh, yeah, come on. What do they call a boat door, hippie kale? What do they call a door on a boat? A bulkhead or uh, stir sturbage or whatever it is. Cabbage, whatever it is. So, um, what do I know? I'm not a boat guy. That's why I estimated the sofa for having to be taken off the, the, the Don boat or yacht. There you go. Don't call it a boat. It's a yacht. Don't call it a yacht. It's a ship. Don't call it a ship. It's a rowboat. I don't know. So, <laughs> so what I did was I had to upholster the sofa on, on the docked ship. But did you know that a docked ship still rocks back and forth? I didn't know that either. I mean, you're talking to a land, land lover, what do they call them? And so I'm upholstering, and wouldn't you know they picked out a stripe, and a very psychedelic stripe at that. So you're going back and forth like this. Oh, I'm getting seasick just thinking about it. And, and I was getting sick, and then, and, oh man, there were other things going on in that boat that I can't tell you. The smells of a Boston Harbor at that time, it wasn't like cleaned up at that point. And, and it, yeah, I was getting the nauseous smells. I don't know how I finished that sofa, but and, and the stripes were pretty. I mean, how do you get something to line up when the it's going like this on you? It's like it was like upholstering something that was moving. It was moving. So I think that was one of my most um, distressing upholstery jobs for sure. Well, Daniel has a, a good question, and I think I know the answer to this one. What's so. that? Not directly, but I'll explain. So he says, have you ever worked on a cursed piece of furniture? I know the story you told me about the restaurant. The furniture itself wasn't cursed, but there are two happened stories. There. there are two stories, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and you know something, you guys? There are curses. If you, if, you are, if you know the Bible, you know the Old Testament, you know that there are curses. Don't, don't, say, don't let anybody say to you, there's no such thing as a curse. That's for uh, people who, who are, you know, who don't, who aren't educated or anything. No, there are curses. Just look in the Old Testament and you'll know there are curses. We were just talking about Egypt, where there were a lot of curses. But anyhow, um, yeah, you know, and I have, I have real, I don't know if I should tell this story, Patrick, about uh, the one about the restaurant is cute, right? Yeah, but the furniture itself wasn't cursed. Uh, he's I, talking about an actual cursed. cursed piece of furniture, and I have to say, I, I can soften this up for people because it's it's kind of a hard subject, but let, I'm going to soften it up. Yes, I had a piece of furniture. I was working in a shop. I was the I was the supervisor of a shop with, uh, you know, we had f a few upholsters in this shop, and I'm going to soften this story a little bit. Um, and so we had a lot of furniture coming in and going out, and there was this one particular furniture that came in. I'll never forget. It was a wing chair. And we had the wing chair, and, and it came in. I, I talked to the customer, and I wrote the job out. And it was scheduled. It was in queue. And um, for some odd reason, um, it got out of queue. And it stayed out of queue. And then there was no reason for it other than um, nobody seemed to want to go near this wing chair. No kidding. And so, um, I, you know, it's kind of, not only that, it was regulated to a corner. It was put in a corner and then put in a back room. And then, you know, the boss came, boss said to me, why, Kevin, why isn't this wing chair, this is, so-and-so's been calling. Oh, I don't know. I, 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 I said, I don't know. So I, I bring it out, back out onto the floor with the intention of putting it up, and it, it, still, was, it still went backwards. It didn't go forward. I and everybody else didn't really want anything to do with this wing chair. So it, it, it went back and back. Finally, the boss said, got to get this done. What's going on here? This other job came in and out, and just like that. And I said, well, okay, okay finally. Yeah, I had to actually start taking it apart. And I was taking it apart. I took the outside back off. And let's just say I found a symbol on the back uh, that's a very difficult symbol for me and other people. You may know it was a World War II symbol. Let's just say that. And I'll leave it like that. But it was a big symbol on the back of that chair. So that, to me, is a definite proof that things do carry um, 
both negative and positive. And, and most of the furniture that I have is positive, thank, thank goodness. I would say 99.9% .9 of the furniture that comes to me is is, is, is endearing to a family. This is, this is, you know, this was my grandfather's, this was my mom's, this was my dad's. That means a lot to me. Um, all, most of it, and once in a while something kind of sneaks in there that uh, does have some negative to it. We have to admit negative, there is negative and positive energy and furniture does carry a lot of that, for sure. Good question, Daniel. I want to ask Daniel if he ever had an experience or if somebody out there had an experience with with furniture that I, I want to hear good stories. I want to hear the good feeling about the, you know we, I've had tons of good feeling stories about furniture. That's the main reason why I'm in business, you know. So I'd like to hear your stories too. So good question. Um, so I'm going to start. I'm going to finish this. Hopefully, um, I have time. We have another question. Daniel asked if it was a German chair. He he knows. I don't know if it was, but the symbol might have been. I'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> I just I want to be sensitive. I'll, I'll tell you why why it hits a nerve with me because a lot of my mentors were from that from that time frame. My father was in, and my all my uncles were in World War II, um, and it wasn't a very pleasant time for anybody really. Um, so. I, I try to be sensitive because I know a lot of people are watching that probably, you know, have some sad stories. Is that another question that you have? Oh no, uh, Erica says, I've seen formal china with that emblem on it on eBay. Who would want to eat from that? Well, yeah. funny thing I've heard, you know this more than me, better than me, you know more about history. I heard that emblem wasn't, before it was used for what it was used for, it did have a bad context. Yeah, it's like it was taken as a matter by of fact, them and, and you it, know, is that true? Yeah, as a matter of fact, in England, in Ireland, they had a, laund a laundry uh, service with that symbol on it before the war. Um, and even up until the 80s, they were using it. Um, I think they finally had to admit this is a this could be a hurtful symbol for people. But I'll tell you another story. That just kind of sucks, you know, something like that. Same thing with that mustache. Nobody can grow that mustache. Right. <laughs> right. It's been ruined forever. Right. <laughs> but there's another story I have. I, I once found, so this, this is interesting, you guys. I once found a letter opener about this big, pure silver letter opener with that symbol on it. I was outraged when I looked at it. This was before this other chair. This was a long time ago. So I took it and I folded it up and I, I took my mallet and I, I hit it. I folded pure silver, really. I don't know if you guys know, it's really soft. Um, and I, I, at least in a letter open form, I could bend it and I, I pushed it down and then I threw it away. And um, I was telling a friend of mine about that and they said, you shouldn't have done that. You know, if, if everybody's throwing away those symbols, they said, I never even would have thought about this. Um, how are we going to remember what had maybe happened to lead to the to those terrible things? So um, I didn't know that there there are museums that would have wanted that letter opener. Who would have known? I didn't know. As a young man, I didn't know. But these are hard subjects, you know. And it's interesting how furniture, you know, furniture is around us. You know, it's it's around us. It it lives with us in history. You know, that's why I like. I like what I'm doing for that reason. I, I, I love history. Um, so, I don't know. We'll off the subject a little bit. But. So, um, any other questions live? Nope. So, I'm going to replace the. I took the, on this chair, I had to be very careful. I took carefully took the outsides off, including the ply grip. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to restaple the ply grip. So, on, that, on our video that we showed, I showed you how to, and I already did this on this. You take your regulator and if the prongs are collapsed because we hammer this in, you could take your regulator and just point the prongs back out. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Turn it. Oh, if you could see that, Michaela, can you see the prongs there? See how the prongs are back shooting out? That's to grab the fabric. So and so up here when you hammer it, right? The prongs get bent around the fabric. 
So you can take your regulator and just poke through here to get it back to new. So I can reuse this. Isn't that cool? And then I'm going to take it and close it about halfway. And then I'm going to bring it around here. I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to trim this up. So it's funny when I stretch the seat, it, I stretched it that much. So I don't need that, right? That's interesting. You want to get it. Um, so let's do this. Well, I haven't thought about those in a long time. Daniel asked a good question, didn't he, Patrick? Yeah, that was really cool. Different question. But that restaurant, boy. You'll have to tell that another time. No, I don't mind telling it. It's around Halloween. It's, it's probably a good time to tell it. Boy, was I scared out of my wits. <laughs> I still can't explain that, Patrick. Maybe I should tell him, huh? Well, only have five minutes. I have to wait till next week. That's a long story. Just remind me. <laughs> I might have already told it. So I get my ply grip all ready to go. The other thing I need to do is I need to restaple the back from the do now. guys get good at repairs. I mean, you have to have a steady hand. You have to be careful with that. You have to know fibers, which you know you don't want to. You don't want to take a job in and, and, and then rip, rip the seat and then call the customer and say, "I got to do the whole sofa of the chair over because I made a mistake." Okay. Then we're going to take. They have what we call we call this piece the stretcher. So we're going to take that and, and re-staple that because I had it up there. Cool, isn't it, you guys? Quick jobs. Sometimes they're quick jobs. I like these quick jobs. And we're running. I don't want to run over, Patrick, because I know you've got something to do. But. This is the stretcher all the way around. It has a burlap stretcher over here and a fabric stretcher on the back. It's fine. I like using recycling, it's a recycling thing. And then we're going to flap down the Dacron. Okay. And that too has stretched out a little bit. I guess it's better to have too much than not enough. Right? So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to cut that down a little bit. Interesting how things can stretch. Then we're ready for our fabric. We're just going to give this a pat down to make sure that we don't have any staples sticking out, which we don't. And then my, my fabric comes down. You want to make sure that your cuts line up here. Right? It's always nerve-wracking to do something live. This was really close on this side. We had one side that was really close with the fabric. Look, you guys. Okay. Staples like right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to finish up by finishing this one side here just to put the put this back. I don't think we're going to have to trim this down. I guess we are going to have to trim it down just a little bit. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Let's go to the other side first. Let's not make a mistake. <clears throat> because I'm wondering why I have more fabric over there. Let's just make sure we're going to be okay on this side. No, this side's good. One second. We're good over here. Let's just go to the other side. I just want to finish this up to show you. I actually have to even trim the fabric. This fabric was stretched a little bit too side to side. So I'm just going to take a little piece off. And then I'm going to regulate, 
call in the regulator. Right? <laughs> right, Patrick? Yeah. <laughs> and finish. We have fun, don't we, you guys? I like I like to I like these question and answer. I hope you guys know that I enjoy these for the most part. I mean Except when Jimmy's here, I don't know. <laughs> 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 ah, Jimmy's a He'll good sport. He'll be back sport. soon. Yeah. He's a good sport. Staple in there. And then put our base welt on. Pretty much that's it, you know. I'll finish the other side. And um, you should have seen this when you go to the YouTube videos, you'll see what this looked like before. This was all, all the springs, there were springs actually turned around. So that's it, you guys. So thanks for joining, and we hope you enjoy these question and answer. Your feedback is essential to us. We're, that's how we, we gauge to, as to what we're doing, if this is you know, worth the time uh, to do all our comments that you make that take time to make a comment. We know that for every comment that we get, there's probably 100 people who, who, um, who are out there too. Um, isn't that what they say? So hopefully... Um, that's true, and that uh, people will keep watching even after the show is live, right, Patrick? We yep. have good response um, with people. We know people are watching even that. Um, so we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me.